But we have someone who was scheduled to speak today, and, and this worked out so beautifully. Apparently, God knows that Raffle was going to get sick today, so he brought his pastor Enoch to fill in. Thank you. Good morning. So when uh, Pastor Brett invited me to come preach, he said, hey, are you available on December 10th? And I said, sure, absolutely. Uh, and then so I asked him, okay, well, what do you want me to preach about? And he said, forgiveness. And I immediately said, awesome, because <laughs> forgiveness is my testimony. So we're going to walk through this. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a whirlwind because uh, the sermon I wrote for this is a five-part sermon, and really it should be five sermons. Uh, and Pastor Brett said, well, you've got about a half hour of time. If you go too far over, we'll start shooting. <laughs> so hopefully I can get this done. Uh, <clears throat> I thought it was really interesting when he gave me the scripture that he was preaching his off of. And uh, he said, I, as long as I include that, I can go anywhere I want to. So I said, okay. And that uh, scripture is, is the story of Christ's birth. I said, you know, I never really thought about how um, the story of the Immaculate Conception can be used as an example of God's forgiveness. But oh man, it is. It, it, that is the absolute main point of it. Um, this, this Advent series, you know, thinking about forgiveness and everything like that, um, we put so much stress on Christmas. And we focus on it so much, and it's a great thing. Christmas is fun and wonderful. But one thing that we fail to realize so often is that Christmas is little more than a shining beacon pointing us straight to Easter. Without Easter, without Christ's uh, sacrifice, death on the cross, and raising from the grave to forgive our sins, without that, Christmas means nothing. It's just another child being born. So, uh, we'll start off, we're going to read Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 22. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of God, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived of in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. For he will save his people from their sins. That is the entire purpose of Jesus. Um... Like I said, it's my testimony. I know a lot about forgiveness. Um, I am a Marine Corps veteran. I served in Iraq in 2004, and I struggled a long time with a lot of demons. Very few of them were actually from Iraq, but it was from the mindset that I had allowed myself to get into. I, uh, I had this rage inside of me that I just could not let go of. I could not get out, and I was I was in a very, very bad place. There were many, many nights um, where I sat on my couch in my basement, looking at my gun, wondering if I should do it or not. And it's because of forgiveness that I'm standing here before you now. It's because of forgiveness that I have this passion that I do to share God's, uh, the, the gospel of Christ with anybody and everybody that I can. I have a ministry called Warrior Way Ministries. It's called Warrior Way Ministries for two reasons. One, I reach out mostly to veterans because that's who I am. I have that heart. I can speak to them. But two, it's because as Christians, uh, the Bible does not shy away from explaining that we are in war. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, <clears throat> so our first point today is that forgiveness is God's gift. In... Um, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. 
Forgiveness is God's gift to us. Yes, he gives us lots of other gifts, but forgiveness is the number one gift. Without it, we have nothing. Without it, we are nothing. <clears throat> Our second point today is that forgiveness is necessary. James 2.10 I'm just going to summarize here. James 2.10 tells us that if you fail in one part of the law, you have failed in all. If you break one part of the law, you have broken every law. And I was talking about Moses' law. There are 613 different rules in the law of Moses. It is virtually impossible for any one of us to go a single day in our lives without breaking one of those 613 rules. Uh, Romans 3.23 it says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But it doesn't stop there. It continues on. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it, by, by just saying all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, it's almost a, a sad verse. Because what hope is there? If we've all sinned, if we've all fallen short, we're all, we're all screwed. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, verse 24 being justified freely by his grace through the, redemp through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ Amen. so yes we've all sinned but because of Jesus we have that availability we have that freedom to be able to move forward in grace Forgiveness is constant. In uh, Matthew chapter 18, <clears throat> Peter asked Jesus a question. And uh, I hear a lot of pastors when they're preaching about it, they, they kind of give Peter a hard time. You know, they always do a mocking voice. Uh, the, Peter asked him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And they always, oh, well, you know, seven times trying to be righteous. I don't think that's what it was. I don't think that's what it was. I think Peter was genuinely curious. How far does this forgiveness go? How far do I need to forgive? And as I was reading over this, um, preparing for today, I got to thinking about my conversations with my children. So often we'll be talking about something. And whenever it's a, a how many times question, they always want an exact number. They always want an answer, you know, so... Well, how many times did you do this? Oh, I, I've done that lots of times. Five? Six? No, 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 way more than that. Twenty? Thirty? No, 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 way more than that. And it keeps going and going and going. And so I think Jesus did what I did, what I usually do, which is uh, way more than that, a ton, you know? And so Jesus said, no, not seven. Seventy times seven. And he didn't mean 490. He meant you just keep doing it. Just keep doing it. Just keep doing it. How many times in our lives do we become frustrated with somebody who just keeps uh, sinning against us, or at least we think they're sinning against us, and they we get, we get fed up, and we forgive them once or twice, and then finally we just go, I'm done. I'm washing my hands, I'm walking away. That's not the heart of Jesus. We're supposed to have the heart of Jesus. Forgiveness needs to be constant. Because when you think about it, when you look at it from the other direction, our forgiveness that we receive from Jesus is constant. Because we mess up every day. Romans 3.23. We all mess up. And he continues to be faithful to forgive us. So we likewise need to be con continue to be faithful to forgive those. Point number four, <laughs> forgiveness is necessary. We're going to continue on right here at uh, that conversation between Peter and Jesus. Peter gives them an example. <clears throat> Starting in verse 22. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. 
<clears throat> a talent in this culture is a is approximately a year's pay. So this guy owned a very large sum of money. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children, and that all they had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience on me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, who owed him a hundred denarii. A denarii is about equal to one day's pay. So it's much, much, much less, uh, or lower debt. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. This is a warning. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Forgiveness is necessary. The first necessary was it's, for, it's necessary for us to be forgiven. This one is necessary for us to forgive. I have had the blessing of experiencing this from both directions. It was a painful, painful lesson but it's one that I am so glad that I got. <clears throat> the first way I experienced this was as the man who had been forgiven much and refused to forgive the little. In my first marriage, um, because of my PTSD and everything like that, I, uh, the rage that I had inside of me, I essentially pushed my wife away from me. And... Um, because of that distance, because of that anger, because of all the uncomfortability in the home, uh, she found another man. I'm a Marine. I'm a warrior. I'm trained to do things. And things is what I was planning on doing. Uh, that guy was dead. He just didn't know it yet. I had everything planned out. He was dead. I was just waiting on the right time. And thankfully, God stepped in and he convicted me and showed me how I had been forgiven and how I was continuing to be forgiven and how evil it was for me to withhold that forgiveness. So I worked through that for a long time. And finally, one day, um, after carrying this burden for so long, I called the guy. He didn't answer, and I really didn't expect him to. But I left a message. And instead of saying, I forgive you for what you did to me, God put it on my heart to ask for his forgiveness. And so, when I got his voicemail, I said, hey, this is Enoch. Um, I'm just calling because I want you to know but I am sorry for the way that I treated you. I am sorry for the way that I went after you. I am sorry for what I planned to do to you. And uh, I think it was the next night, he actually called me back. And he likewise apologized for everything that I had done. He extended forgiveness to me and I extended forgiveness to him. We're not friends. You don't have to be friends when you forgive somebody. That's, that's not what it's about. Forgiving somebody is your desire and willingness to see them in heaven. That's what forgiveness is. <clears throat> and I tell you what, when I made, when I received that return phone call and we had that conversation, I had, I felt a physical burden being lifted off my shoulders. I could 
finally breathe again. It was so amazing. The second time I experienced this um, was after my divorce, I, uh, for some reason, my, my high school sweetheart was always in my mind. And I knew she was married and had kids and everything like that. And I wasn't, I wasn't looking to, to fire anything back up there, but I was always curious about her, about where her life was and what was going on. <coughs> so I reached out to her. I sent her a message on Facebook, and a little while later, I got a very, very uncomfortable message back. Because I was a wicked teenager, I didn't treat her the way she deserved to be treated. I didn't care about uh, protecting her as a daughter of God. I only cared about what teenage boys care about. And I took, and I took, and I took, and I didn't give. I thought I was, but I wasn't. And it damaged her in ways that I would never realize until finally we had this conversation. The way I treated her, the things that I tried to get her to do, which thank God she was stronger than me and she didn't, um, it damaged her in ways that affected her marriage with her husband. They were on the rocks. They were having a horrible time. They weren't getting along. And the reason why all of that happened is because they had hatred in their hearts. <coughs> Her husband, a man I'd never met before, hated me because of what I had done to his wife. And quite honestly, I can totally understand it. But what's really cool, and as the conversation continued, um, is that he was driving down the road one day, angry, cursing me, and uh, wishing harm on me and everything like that. And he, he said he heard God speak to him. And Jesus said, I died on that cross for Enoch too. And right then, this man's heart was, was broken and he decided to forgive me. And through this conversation, I, I learned of their forgiveness, and I was able to apologize and ask for their forgiveness. And again, another massive weight was lifted off of me. So often, we don't realize the implications that our, for, our unforgiveness have on those around us. When we are not willing to forgive them, we are quite literally holding them down. <coughs> Remember verse 31. Sorry, 35. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother's trespasses. That verse right there was a huge gut check for me. Was I really a Christian? Was I really following God? Was I really willing to do whatever it takes to follow Christ? I was willing to do whatever it took to accomplish the mission in Iraq. Was I willing to do everything that it took to accomplish my mission here? And that mission, when you boil it all down, is forgiveness. Nothing more and nothing less. Now, finally, our fifth point is forgiveness is your testimony. Um, can we have the, the worship team come up, please? Luke chapter 7, verse 36 through 15. <clears throat> Jesus is invited for a dinner at uh, one, of the, one of the Pharisees, one of the religious elite's homes. And... Uh, while he was there, it says, And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus was at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, and stood at his feet <clears throat> behind him, weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears, and wipe them from the hair of her head, 
And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he spoke. <clears throat> when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, uh, one, one thing you'll learn as you read the scriptures, if you're around Jesus, uh, don't ever think any embarrassing thoughts because he's going to make them known. Yeah. <laughs> and Jesus said, answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There is a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose it's the one he forgave more. And Jesus said to him, you have, <clears throat> you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me, excuse me, you gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. This woman was a prostitute. We can assume because of the ravages that that horrible profession takes on the female body. I think it's pretty safe for us to assume that she had many physical ailments that she desired to have healed. Who knows how many children she had abortions she had, miscarriages she had. Who knows how many times she was beaten? Who knows how many times she was um, robbed, left for dead, mistreated, spit on, slandered? She wasn't asking for an easier life here. She wasn't asking for whatever physical uh, problems she had to be taken <coughs> care of. All she cared about was her soul. So often in hearing testimonies, or in sharing our testimonies, we focus on the, uh, the physical things that God has done for us, or that we have seen him do. And make no mistake, it's awesome. It is amazing when you get to witness somebody be cured of cancer miraculously, or a broken bone set, or a marriage reunited. And that list can go on and on and on. But all of those things, no matter how awesome they are, absolutely pale in comparison to the healing that we get through His forgiveness. Absolutely pale. Yes, we feel them now. But if you are truly a child of God, you are not a mere mortal being. You are not only here for 70, 80, 90 years but you will live on for all of eternity. So when you take, if you were able to draw out a line that stretched to either end of eternity, and if you were trying to mark out your physical life on that line, you would never be able to see it. Because it's so small, so insignificant. So while, yes, the trials of our life, the pains of our life are important to us, they pay on comparison to our eternal life. Focus on that forgiveness. <clears throat> because yes, if, if you're able to stand there and say that Jesus cured you of cancer, that's good. It'll get somebody's attention. But if that's where you stop, it leaves them thinking. Thinking of him as little more than a genie, just granting wishes. But if you're to continue on, 
say, yes, I was cured of cancer, or yes, he fixed that broken bone, or yes, I was homeless and now I have a house. If you were to continue on and say, as amazing as that is, I don't care. Give me the cancer back. Break that bone again. Take my home away. Take my family away. Do whatever, as long as I get to hold on to that forgiveness. Yeah. That's where your testimony has true power. That's where it has staying power. And that's how you'll get people hungry for Christ as we truly know him.
this that I've experienced. And nothing more. It's not mine. It's not me being me. It's not me doing the good work. It's because of the forgiveness that I've received. I want nothing more than to allow Jesus to work through me. To share my testimony with them. And I promise you that if you are willing to honestly share your testimony with whoever God puts in front of you, the people that he puts in front of you, your testimony is the perfect story for them to hear. God doesn't make mistakes. That amazing grace is why I'm standing here. That amazing grace is why I have the family that I have now. Because if it were me, I wouldn't have any of it. So now we have some questions to ask. And these are, I want you guys to really think about these over the next, the next weeks leading up to Christmas. And remembering that Christmas is that shining beacon that points straight at Easter and the work that was done on the cross. Ask, is forgiveness a constant in your life? Do you continue to forgive people who have wronged you? Or do you cut them off after a few relapses? And if you cut them off after a few relapses, I want you to think about what your life would be like if Jesus cut you off after a few of yours. Question two. Do you view it as a necessity to forgive those who have wronged you, no matter how badly they have hurt you? I can tell you from my experience, and you heard a part of my story, that it is necessary, no matter how badly they have hurt you, no matter what they've stolen from you. If you forgive them, one way or another, God's going to make it right. And number three, and this is the big one. Is your testimony centered on how God forgave you? No matter how you tell your story, no matter who you're telling your story to, do you always point back to that forgiveness that you've received, that amazing grace, that blessed gift? Do you always point back to that? And if, if you don't, I, I really encourage you to go through and rethink the way you're sharing your faith and ask for God to work on you. One way that he can work on you through this is, is through this challenge that I'm laying out before you. This challenge is going to take a little bit of courage and it's going to take a whole lot of vulnerability. I want each and every one of you to go home and share your testimony with someone who is close and intimate with you, your spouse, brother, sister, parent, someone. Because no matter how close you are, there's always things that they may not know about you. They, they might know the facts of the situation, but do they know the emotions behind it? They might know you're a Christian, but do they know why? So when you share that testimony with them, when you finish, I want you to ask them for feedback. And this is where the vulnerability and the courage part of it comes from. I want you to sit there and allow them to say, wow, I never knew that about you. Or to say, you know, you left that part out. Why do you leave that part out? Is that truly something you're grateful for? <clears throat> anything that's worth doing is worth practicing. And your testimony is worth doing. Um, in the Marine Corps, we would train to such a degree that we, we could act without thinking. It's called muscle memory. When you're in a fight and somebody throws a punch at you, <laughs> Without having to sit there and think, oh my goodness, there's a fist coming at me. What do I need to do? You just instinctively react. You block. You knock it off to the side. You step inside and throw your own hook. You do something. 
Same thing in a firefight. If they attack you from this direction, what are you going to do? You train to the point where you don't have to think about what you're going to do. You just do it. The same thing should be said with your testimony. Because as I said earlier, we are in a war. We are in spiritual warfare each and every day of our lives. So practice and train so you can be an effective warrior for Christ. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you so much for the awesome uh, opportunity to come and speak to this body of believers, this church, Lord God. I thank you for their faith in you. I thank you, Lord God, for the, for the work that you do in this body. I, I know people in this room and I know where they've come from and to see them sitting here faithfully following you, learning from you and allowing you to work in their lives such an amazing gift, Lord God. You indeed are awesome and powerful, Lord. I pray as we leave from here today that if I have said anything that is not right or true or accurate according to your word, Lord God, that it would be forgotten before they ever need the doors. Lord, I pray that the things that I have said that are right and true and holy, Lord God, that they will be bound to the hearts of all who have heard, Lord God, because they are your words and not mine. I pray, Lord, that we would go for it. <clears throat> Forgiving freely because we have been freely forgiven. I thank you, God. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 The chains are come.